Hello, today we're going to be talking about the Alaskan Pollock fishery. It's one of the largest fisheries in the world and the largest in the United States. So why are we spending a whole class on Alaskan Pollock? Well, odds are you've consumed Alaskan Pollock before. If you consume sushi, a fish fillet sandwich, fish stick products, or even the fish oil found in Target, you've definitely consumed Alaskan Pollock. A fun fact is that 47% of the sushi products on Bento's men menu has Alaskan Pollock in it in the form of imitation crab. So the overview of the talk today, we're going to start off with the biology and the habitat. Then we'll briefly talk about the history. Then we'll talk about the structure of it. And then we'll chat about why it's so sustainable. And we'll finish off with the future of it. What is an Alaskan pollock? Well, it's a walleye pollock. It's in the genus Gaddis, meaning it is a cod. And because it's a cod, it's considered a ground fish because its main habitat is just above the sea floor. They do school and they are the most abundant ground fish in Alaska with over 9.6 billion fish. And don't confuse it with an Atlantic pollock which is not in the genus Gaddis, and they're only found in the Atlantic Ocean, while walleye pollock are only in the Pacific. To identify Alaskan pollock from other Pacific cobs, you can determine that by the lack of a barbel under its chin and its blotched dorsal area. Now we're going to talk about the internal anatomy of Alaskan pollock. As seen on the right hand side of your slide, it's a diagram of the internal anatomy of an Atlantic cod, which is a good substitute for Alaskan pollock. As we've discussed before in this class, fish that have large, fatty, and oily livers use static lift for buoyancy, and they don't rely heavily on their air bladder. In addition, as we've discussed before in this class, fish that have white muscle tissue are fast twitch, which means that they have quick bursts. They do not use oxygen, therefore they are anaerobic processes. And this indicates to us that Alaskan pollock are slow moving and bottom feeding. Now we're going to talk about the length and age of Alaskan pollock. Usually when they enter the fishery, they're between 12 to 20 inches and they weigh between one to three pounds. They are a moderately aged fish with a lifespan ranging from 10 to 15 years with a maximum age of 22 years. If you look at the graph on the right hand side of the slide, you, you can see that they are a fast growing fish. If you look at the X axis in years and the Y axis in length, an Alaskan pollock reaches 12 inches at age three. Now we're gonna talk about the reproduction of Alaskan pollock. A term we've seen before is iteroparous, meaning spawning more than one time. Alaskan pollock can reach maturity between 11 to 13 inches, and that takes around three to five years. Alaskan pollock can actually start maturity as early as age two, but most of the spawning biomass is between the years four and five. If you look at the image on the right-hand side of the slide, you can see that when they are mature and ready to spawn, their eggs take up most of their body cavity. So their fecundity is between 140 to 300,000 eggs. And they are also batch spawners, meaning that they lay more than one batch per year. 
a Pollock is capable of 10 batches per year. So a single Pollock has the potential to lay 300,000 eggs times 10, which is 3 million eggs. That's a lot of eggs. In addition to having a moderate to large fecundity, they also form spawning aggregations in the spring. And we'll touch on that later, why that's so important. Now we're going to transition to the juvenile diet of Alaskan pollock. Alaskan pollock primarily feed on zooplankton, such as copepods, opossum shrimp, or mycids, krill, or euphacidids. As you can see on the diagram on the bottom of the screen, Alaskan pollock do not feed until after their yolk sac larval stage. And that is because during that period, they still rely on the fats and lipids from their egg. Once they enter the feeding larval stage, that is when they primarily eat zooplankton and they continue to eat zooplankton throughout the rest of their juvenile life stage. Juvenile pollock play critical roles in the Alaskan food web. As you can see on the diagram on the bottom of your screen, juvenile pollock are important prey items for marine mammals such as harbor seals and sea lions, important ground fish such as arrowtooth flounders and cods, and even birds such as puffins. But most importantly, they are an important prey for adult walleye pollock, as cannibalism occurs during the egg stage, early and late juvenile stages. Now we're going to transition to talking about the adult diet of Alaskan pollock. Smaller adults consume zooplankton such as krill, but that's mainly for Alaskan pollock under 15 inches. As adults grow larger, they mainly consume fish, such as smelts. And as we've discussed before, juvenile pollock are important prey for adult pollock. Cannibalism actually can make up 44% of the total stomach contents by weight. Now we're going to talk about the predators of adult pollock. Adult pollock and juvenile pollock are highlighted by the red boxes. As you can see, juveniles and adults share similar predators. Adult walleye pollock are predated on by arrowtooth flounder, Pacific halibut, Pacific cod, and marine mammals such as stellar sea lions. In addition, let's talk more about the food web. As you can see, walleye pollock do not feed high on the trophic system. As you can see on the y-axis, their trophic level is between 3.5 and 4. And a lot of their prey are zooplankton, highlighted by the yellow boxes of euphacidids and copepods. And in addition, as we've spoken before, they also feed on capelin. But as you can see, capelin also primarily feed on zooplankton. So, a key takeaway is that the walleye pollock do not feed highly on the trophic level system. Now we're going to transition to the habitat of Alaskan pollock. As we discussed before, Alaskan pollock are also walleye pollock, and the distribution of walleye pollock are from the Sea of Japan to Northern California. So as you can tell, walleye pollock and Alaskan pollock prefer cold temperatures. As you can see, they're only found in high latitudes. Now we're going to take a deeper dive into the range of Alaskan pollock. As you can see on the map on the left-hand side, Alaskan pollock are found between the Bering Sea and the Gulf of Alaska. There's actually two distinctive genetic stocks of Alaskan pollock, with one being in the Bering Sea and the other in the Gulf of Alaska. They are divided by this archipelago 
called the Aleutian Islands, which is just south of Bristol Bay. On the right hand side, this map shows that Alaskan pollock are heavily distributed in the U.S. economic exclusive zone and that there are fewer in the Russian economic zone. And we'll talk about why that's so important later in this talk. Now that we've talked about the range of Alaskan pollock, now we'll talk about their distribution with depth. As we've discussed before, Alaskan pollock perform spawning aggregations in deep waters during the spring season. After they spawn, these eggs move up the water column, and during the spring and early summer, these eggs hatch and they start to move inshore, and they actually stay inshore for about a year to two. When they grow to a certain size, these juvenile pollocks start to move offshore to deeper waters, and that's when they start to become susceptible to cannibalization by these adult walleye pollock. Now to tie everything together, here is a simple Alaskan pollock migration diagram. Let's start off in the south during the spring. As we've discussed before, Alaskan pollock perform spawning aggregations. And that's usually right off of the continental shelf in the southern region of the Bering Sea. After they spawn, in the late summer and early fall, they move north along this continental shelf. And that's when they focus all their activity on feeding and that is because this continental shelf allows oceanographic features such as upwelling to occur as we've discussed before in this class upwelling is when cold water that's full of nutrients comes higher into the water column and allows for the production of phytoplankton and as we've discussed before Walleye pollock or Alaskan pollock primarily feed on zooplankton and fish that rely on zooplankton. So with the increased amount of phytoplankton, there is an increased amount of zooplankton. And therefore, that is where the Alaskan pollock feed. And after feeding, they start to move south right along this continental shelf again where they're able to spawn. Please focus your attention on the Aleutian Islands. You see this port name called Dutch Harbor, which is the largest port in the US. So we'll talk about why it's important that these spawning aggregations occur so close to the port of Dutch Harbor. So how do these biological traits relate to the fishery aspect of Alaskan pollen? Well, to review, they're schooling fish and they form spawning aggregations, so they're way easier to catch for fishermen. And because they're primarily composed of white muscle tissue, that is a form of tissue that us humans prefer to eat, which means that there's a high demand for this type of fish. In addition, Alaskan pollock have really large biomass and are fast growing which enables a really large fisheries for them. In addition, they have a young age and maturity, a large fecundity, and are batch spawners. So that makes them less susceptible to being overfished. So with a combination of all these factors, that is why Alaskan pollock are capable of sustaining such a large fisheries. Now that we reviewed the biology of Alaskan pollock, now we're gonna focus on the history of its fishery. So please keep all of your fins in the time machine as we transport back to the 1960s. Before we even talk about the history of the Alaskan pollock, we need to understand why there was such a high demand for it in the first place. Well, that starts on the Atlantic Ocean with the Atlantic cod. 
As you can see in the figure on the screen, the catch of Atlantic cod rose in the early 1960s, and that was due to the introduction of advanced technology from World War II, such as sonar. This sonar made catching Atlantic cod and other ground fish very easy, up to the point that catches exceeded 700,000 tons, as you can see on the y-axis. Sadly, after the 1970s, the catch dropped extraordinarily, going from 700,000 to under 200,000 tons. And that is what made the demand for pollock increase. It needed to replace such a high demand of Atlantic cod. So with the collapse of Atlantic cod, countries started to try to find a good substitute for it. So they packed their boats and headed west to the Pacific Ocean. And that's when they found Alaskan pollock. Therefore, historical catches of Alaskan pollock were very low until 1964. And that was due to a predominantly exploratory fishery solely by Japan. It wasn't until the late 1960s that uh, countries such as Japan, the former Soviet Union or USSR, and Scandinavian countries such as Norway started to fish for Alaskan pollock in our Alaskan waters. As you can see, Alaskan waters is in quotations because during this time period, what we know as modern day Alaskan waters was actually classified as international waters. It wasn't until the 1980s is when U.S. vessels started to enter the Alaskan Pollock fishery, and we'll explain why in the next slide. And in addition, the U.S. vessels weren't fully domesticated until 1988, and we'll touch on that in the next slide. So what enabled U.S. fishermen to enter the Alaskan Pollock fishery in the 1980s? Well, in the year 1976, two senators by the name of Warren Magnuson from the state of Washington and Ted Stevens from the state of Alaska combined together and passed the Magnuson-Stevens Fishery Conservation and Management Act. This act enabled the U.S. Exclusive Economic Zone to go from 12 nautical miles and extend it to 200 nautical miles. Despite this extension, foreign vessels were still allowed to fish within the U.S. exclusive economic zone if they had a minority U.S. ownership group. This changed with the passing of the American Fisheries Act in 1998, which established a 75% minimum U.S. ownership group per vessel. In addition, this act also set up allocations for every sector in the Alaskan pollock fishery, which we will talk about in the next upcoming slides. Now we're going to focus on the structure of the Alaskan pollock fishery. Before we talk about the structure of the Alaskan pollock fishery, first we have to talk about how they're caught. Well, Alaskan pollock are caught using something called a midwater trawl. They are different from bottom trawls that are used in the Gulf of Mexico for shrimp or even for flatfish in Alaska. Midwater trawls target pollock just above the seafloor, so there is minimal damage to seafloor habitat using this methodology. In addition to the midwater trawls, Alaskan pollock are caught in, by bycatch in the longline and pot fisheries. Now let's start talking about the different sectors of the Alaskan pollock fishery. To start us off, let's talk about catcher vessels or CVs. They are smaller vessels ranging from 40 to 165 feet. These are usually the boat that people think of as a traditional Alaskan fishing boat. As you can see, they come into a wide variety of styles. 
Usually they have small crews ranging from four to five people. The main takeaway is that these vessels only catch fish. They do not process fish. In addition, this, this fishery sector only offloads to onshore plants. So they have short trip durations, but they are allocated 50% of the total Alaskan pollock catch. Now let's transition to another sector in the Alaskan pollock fishery, such as the mothership processor sector. As you can see in the image, they are the largest vessels, ranging up to 368 feet. And as the name entails, they are a processing only vessel, and they have large crews up to 159 people. Well, you might be asking yourself, if they're a processing only vessel, where do they get their catch? Well, motherships are designated a few catcher vessels, which transfer their catches through two ways, such as a cod end transfer, where a crane on the mothership takes the cod end from a catcher vessel and dumps it into her hull, or they actually pump the catch, so a large vacuum from the mothership goes onto the catcher vessel and pumps the Alaskan pollock into its, her hull. And as you can imagine by the size of a mothership, they have a long duration offshore in the magnitude of weeks. However, despite the size, they are allocated the smallest amount of the quota at only 10%. Now let's finish it off with the catcher processor sector. As you can see in the two images, these are large vessels ranging from 272 feet to 336 feet. And as you can tell from these two images, a lot of catcher processors look very similar, and that is because they're factory trawlers. Therefore, they have factories within the lower levels of the ship. And as the name suggests, these are the only boats that are capable of catching and processing Alaskan pollock. And that is why they are required large crew sizes for up to 135 people. And due to their size, not like the catcher vessels, these ships are capable of going long distances offshore. And that is why trip durations can last from days to weeks. It really depends on how efficient the crew on the boat is. And they are allocated 40% of the total Alaska Pollock allocation. Now let's talk about the structure of the Alaskan Pollock fishery. Well, Alaskan Pollock is managed by the National Marine Fisheries Service, which is a subsection of NOAA. As we've discussed before, Alaskan Pollock is divided into two regions, the Bering Sea Aleutian Islands, which is indicated by the BSAI on the map on the right-hand side of the slide, and with the Gulf of Alaska, which is indicated by the GOA. As we've discuss discussed before, Alaskan Pollock are genetically distinct between the two regions. And most of the catch is from the Bering Sea Aleutian Island region. Now let's take a deeper dive to the structure of the Alaskan Pollock fishery in the Bering Sea. There are two seasons for Alaskan Pollock, the first being A season, which opens up on January 20th and closes to early to mid April. And as you can see on the map designated 2022A, a lot of their catch is in the southern region of the Bering Sea. And that is because, as we've talked before, that is when Alaskan pollock form spawning aggregations. And these fishers are actually targeting them before they spawn for their eggs. So Alaskan pollock eggs, or roe, is actually a delicacy in a lot of Asian markets. Now let's talk about bee season. Bee season opens on June 10th and it closes on November 1st. 
This is when fishers are actually targeting Alaskan pollock for their fillets rather than their roe. What can you see that's the major difference between 2022B and 22A? You can see that a lot of the catch is more northerly, and that is because, as we discussed, Alaskan pollock migrate during the fall to a more northern environment. That means catcher vessels are unable to catch these migrating Alaskan pollock, and only catcher processors are capable of going those distances offshore. But as you can see, there's still a good amount of catch on the, su on the southern region of the Bering Sea, and that is predominantly catcher vessels. Now let's talk about the catch history of Alaskan pollock in the Bering Sea. Look at the graph in the center of the screen. Catch in tons is on the y-axis, and time in years is on the x-axis. You can see at certain times, catch can go over 1.5 million tons. That is an extremely large amount of fish. If you combine the green area and the blue area, that is the total catch in B season, compare that to the red area, which is the catch in A season, there is higher amounts of catch during B season. And as stated before, that is because fishers are targeting them for their fillets. Rather, in A season, they are targeting Alaskan pollock for their roe. Now let's hop on south and talk about the catch history in the Gulf of Alaska. Look at the graph in the center of your screen. On the y-axis, it's catches in thousands of tons, and time in years on the x-axis. While the Alaskan pollock fishery in the Gulf of Alaska is nowhere near the Alaska pollock fishery in the Bering Sea, it still records a high amount of catch. If you think about it, in the certain years, such as 2015, catches go above 250,000 tons. While that's not comparable to the Bering Sea, it's still a really large fishery elsewhere. So what happens to our Alaskan pollock after it gets caught? It's usually turned into one of these products, surimi, roe, fillets, fish meal, or fish oil. Let's start off with surimi. Surimi is often called imitation crab or crab with a K. It's found in a lot of sushi products. What composes surimi is all the body parts not used in the filleting process. So that includes the skin and the bones and other regions. It's turned into a gelatinous gel. Roe, as we discussed before, are the fish eggs, and they are a delicacy in Eastern Asian markets. They're usually salted and eaten whole or put into a stew. What a lot of people are familiar with Alaskan Pollock products are fillets. Fillets are usually turned into a fish sandwich or fish sticks. Lastly, Alaskan Pollock are also turned into fish meal or fish oil. Fish meal is used to make food for aquaculture or even your cat food or dog food. As you can imagine, with such a large fishery, it must have a huge economic impact, and it does. As seen in the year 2022, there are 2.7 billion pounds landed, and that gave an exit vessel value of $316 million. But Alaskan Pollock, once they're processed, fetch a higher value. As you can see on the top right-hand side of the screen, Alaskan Pollock had 1.5 billion pounds processed into presumably fillets, and that fetched for a value of $1.9 billion, which is the most in the United States. 
In addition, the Alaskan pollock fishery supports local indigenous communities as well through a program called the Community Development Quota, where local indigenous communities get 10% of the total Alaskan pollock quota. And these local indigenous communities have the capabilities to either catch their own pollock to sell or they're allowed to sell their quota to interested fishing vessels. In addition to supporting jobs such as captains and engineers on these ships, a lot of the, the jobs are actually onshore with these processing plants. As you can see in the table on the lower right hand side of the screen, there are 9,400 workers on these onshore processing plants compared to the 4,600 that are actually on the boat themselves. So this fishery has a really wide range of impact. Now let's talk about the sustainability of Alaskan Pollock. Let's start it off by talking about the advanced technology being used in this fishery. On the left hand side are two images inside of a wheelhouse. As you can see, there's a multitude of different sonars and mapping equipment used. These vessels do not fish in the same spot twice. As you can tell, even though they're called fishing vessels, they should be called catching vessels. Every time they put their net into their water, they're basically guaranteed Alaskan pollock, and that is due to this multitude of technology used. On the right hand side is a big reason why these Alaskan pollock catcher processors are very efficient in their catch. Focus your attention on the yellow sensor on top of the cod end of one Alaskan pollock hull. As you can see, that's a really large cod end of Alaskan pollock. I took this photo and I'm six foot one, so that cod end is over six feet high and it's about 80 feet long. So that's a lot of fish. And these yellow sensors on the cod end actually tell the captain the percent filled it is while it's still in the water. And these cod ends are filled with cameras telling the captain exactly what is happening inside of their nets while they're trawling. You might be scratching your head and asking yourself, how is a fishery this big sustainable? Well, a big answer to that is the science involved. First, we're going to talk about the fishery independent data. Fishery independent data is collected via two ways. The first being acoustic surveys and the second one being bottom trawl surveys. If, if you gear your attention to the right hand side of the screen, you can see a diagram of an acoustic survey. Acoustic surveys are conducted when a sound is emitted from a research vessel and that sound bounces off the air bladders of walleye pollock and it reaches back to the research vessel and this tells scientists the biomass of walleye pollock in that certain area. The second are bottom trawl surveys which are trawl surveys conducted by research vessels themselves. So these vessels go all around the Bering Sea and they conduct surveys where fishermen are not catching walleye pollock to give a, a more holistic view of the population of Alaskan pollock throughout the Bering Sea and not just in areas where they are targeted at. Now we're going to be talking about fishery dependent data. And as the name suggests, this is data collected on board fishing vessels. This is done two ways. First with observer coverage and secondly with electronic monitoring. So what does 100% observer coverage mean? It means that any, any vessel targeting Alaska Pollock that's over 40 feet is mandated to have a scientifically trained observer. As being one for a couple of years, some of the duties that are involved include recording effort data, 
recording catch data and recording by catch data. Most of my time was 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 taken by collecting this by catch data. As you can see on the image on the right hand side of your screen, there's a lot of different species caught in a pollock trawl. The redfish is called the, the Pacific Ocean perch, and you can see some squid. So why is it important to collect this bycatch information? Well, first off, because I'm, I am on a pollock trawler and I'm a scientifically trained observer, these pollock trawlers kind of act as a pseudo research vessel. And this is because not only am I collecting data on Alaskan pollock, I'm also collecting important information on other species found in Alaskan environments. That includes collecting biological specimens, such as otoliths for aging information, and even genetic samples of salmon. Here is a short example of what sampling on a Alaskan pollock catcher processor looks like. A lot of the sampling occurs within the factory of the ship. We'll touch on more about what sampling looks like on the following slide. Okay, let's take a deeper dive into a, a sample from an Alaskan pollock haul. Okay, let's do a scenario. It's 3 a.m., you're on the 10th hour of your 12 hour shift, the boat just received the haul, and it's your time to sample. On top of that, you're in the middle of the Bering Sea where waves are 20 feet hot. Okay, you go down to the factory to take your sample. You need to take a 15,000 kilogram sample. And within the sample, you see a variety of, of different species, ranging from Pacific Cod to Alaska Skate, Pacific Herring, Blathead Sole, Rock Sole, Pollock. You might be asking yourself, isn't it pretty hard to identify between the different sole species? Well, it is. and and being up at 3 a.m. and being tossed around by 20 foot seas definitely doesn't help the identification process. So now that you've correctly identified all the different species within your sample, it's time to sort them. Every fish has to be sorted by species and a total count of them has to be recorded and a total weight needs to be associated as well. Then you take your subset of the pollock within that 15,000 kilogram haul. After that, you add up your bycatch and your pollock subset and subtract it from your total of amount. This is extremely important since every sample is extrapolated to the haul. Luckily, you have to take three samples per haul, and that's about 33% of the entire haul. As you can see, this is a, a time-consuming effort to take a sample. Every sample can range from either half an hour to two hours, depending about the size of a sample and the bycatch within it. However, De despite it taking so much effort and so much time, it's very important that you take the correct counts and weights. 
since this is one of the key reasons why the Alaskan Pollock fishery is so sustainable. Now let's talk about the management of Alaskan Pollock. Let's start off with the scientists. The scientists create an allowable biological catch. So from their surveys, they determine the amount of Pollock that could be removed from the stock before herding it. This information is relayed to managers and managers create a total allowable catch. So this total allowable catch or TAC is usually under the ABC. So there should not be any, any damage to the Alaskan fish stock. Then this TAC is split into individual transferable quotas or individual fishing quotas. This gives an allocation to every boat within the Alaskan Pollock fishery. And this is beneficial since these boats do not have to compete against each other for this TAC, it eliminates the race to fish. We've briefly discussed about the bycatch in the Alaskan Pollock fishery. But the Alaskan Pollock fishery is extremely clean, with a bycatch being under 1%. However, due to the scale of the fishery, bycatch can still be an issue. In 2014, Pollock was landed at 2.8 billion pounds of fish. And out of the 2.8 billion pounds of fish, 11 million was considered bycatch, so fish that were not Alaskan Pollock. Bycatch usually consists of squid, Pacific Ocean perch, sole, and salmon, but mainly chum salmon. So we know Alaskan pollock is an extremely clean fishery, but is bycatch still an issue? Well, it can be. Let's look at the case study of Bering Sea Chinook salmon. You can see on the graph on the top right portion of your slide, the number of Chinook salmon on the y-axis and years on the x-axis. You can see in the years such as 2007, the catch of Chinook salmon reached 120,000 fish. But in the year 2011, they implemented a hard cap for bycatch of Chinook salmon. So what is a hard cap? It means that the Alaskan Pollock fishery is unable to exceed the amount determined by scientists. And it's done a really good job. As you can see, since the implementation of a hard cap, the catch of Chinook salmon has lowered exponentially. In addition to this hard cap, trawlers started to install salmon excluder devices, which are very similar to turtle excluder devices used in the Gulf. As pollock and salmon swim in the water column, Salmon are usually higher in the water column than pollock. So once caught by a trawl, the salmon excluder device actually gives salmon an opportunity to, to escape from the caught end while still retaining all pollock. So to wrap up this presentation, now we're going to talk about the future of the Alaskan pollock fishery. As with other fisheries, climate change can have a large effect on it, and that is no exception with the Alaskan Pollock fishery. Here's a short little case study. In the early 2010s, a patch of warm water called the Blob emerges. The Blob, originated in the Bering Sea in the Gulf of Alaska, spread south along the Pacific coast. While it is common to have elevated sea surface temperatures, the blob lasted longer than many other warm pools of water. And in addition of lasting longer, it actually spread further than usual pools of warm water. And as we know, Alaskan pollock prefer cold water. So how does climate change affect Alaskan pollock? and its respective fishery. Well, in the years of cold temperatures, the Alaskan Pollock stay more south in the Bering Sea. 
as seen on the map on the left hand side. But in periods of warm water, the Alaskan Pollock actually move more north and even to the, the west. And as you can see, some of the Alaskan Pollock found in the US economic exclusive zone actually move into the Russian economic exclusive zone. If you're still interested in learning more about the topic, I recommend a book called The Billion Dollar Fish. It's a great read. If you're more into watching TV, there's a great episode on the History Channel about it as well. It's a must watch. So that wraps up our talk on Alaskan Pollock. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to send me an, an email, especially if you're interested in a career as a scientific observer. I will also be conducting office hours next week. So if you have any questions on Alaskan Pollock, I'll be more than happy to answer them. And thank you for your time.